So tonight's topic is inequality and the elimination of the extremes of wealth and poverty. And we have three presentations, each coming from a diverse angle. Very interesting in the diversity of ideas, which is exactly what we want. We'll be having presentations by Ian Digby, Joachim Monkoban, and Rhonda Gosse. Straight over to and welcome Ian. And he's going to be talking on the role of tax in removing extremes, which of course is something as professional expertise in, as well as a great knowledge of the Baha'i writings in this area. Because tax is an enormously uh, important issue of social discourse at the moment, uh, especially around avoidance, both individual and corporate. The role of tax in the removal of extremes of wealth and poverty at Baha'i writings that uh, speak to this question. And there is very little in the writing specifically about tax, of course, but uh, Abdul Baha has specifically referred in more than one place to a system of proportionate taxation, uh, graduated taxation. And here is the quote uh, from Foundations of World Unity. Each person in the community whose income is equal to his individual producing capacity shall be exempt from taxation. But if his income is greater than his needs, he must pay a tax until an adjustment is, eff is effected. That is to say, a man's capacity for production and his needs will be equalized and reconciled through taxation. Therefore, taxation will be proportionate to capacity and production, and there will be no poor in the community. And Abdul Baha elucidates this further in, in various other quotations, but this is the core um, message that I could glean from his uh, talks uh, in the West and his other writings, which is that there should be specifically a system of proportionate taxation to equalize wealth or to bring about a, uh, an equalization of uh, opportunities. And then we find that in the writings, what really applies to this issue of taxation is the underpinning ethical and spiritual attitudes that must exist for any form or system of taxation to actually work and to be effective. Trustworthiness, trustworthiness is the greatest portal leading unto the tranquility and security of the people. Uh, generosity, tell the rich of the midnight sighing of the poor. And on the work ethic, two quotations about uh, the need to earn a livelihood and uh, not to, not to uh, beg, not to sit and beg. And the last quotation that I've picked out is that of uh, Shoghi Effendi referring to uh, this beautiful exposition that he's given of how the future Baha'i world commonwealth will function. And of course, this is something that will go on, become realized fully a long way into the future. Uh, but this is the goal towards which we're working. Some form of world superstate must be evolved, in whose favor all the nations of the world will have willingly ceded every claim to make war and certain rights to impose taxation. I think this is really, really important when it comes to avoidance on the personal and corporate and governmental level. That it's no good just having a, a nice cozy cooperative um, agreement and you know effort to try and solve the problems of international tax avoidance. There has to be a firm, uh, fully authoritative system of world government underpinned by these three pillars of an international executive, a world parliament and a supreme tribunal. So that if countries try to engage in gaming the tax system, they will be forced not to. So I think this is absolutely uh, crucial to the whole uh, picture. So then these are the issues that I've picked out and forgive me if they're a bit uh, disconnected, but I'll go through them and hopefully they'll, they'll spark up some, some, uh, some ideas. There are spiritual solutions. We have, to be, we have to understand tax as something that's needed and be willing to actually pay it, uh, not to expend all our effort trying to avoid it, which is what a lot of people do, and particularly the, the very wealthy. I mentioned the graduated system of taxes that Abdul Baha has uh, specifically prescribed. International law and cooperation. And then in considering tax, the idea of economic theories always is pertinent. 
uh, because it underpins some of the attitude towards tax. Uh, in recent years, we've seen this trickle down theory, which I think has been recently exposed as false. Uh, but a lot of tax attitudes and policies have grown up around this idea that, oh, cut tax and everybody will become more wealthy. So these false theories do have a huge impact on, on tax policy. And then in trying to see how the Baha'i teachings can help us to address these problems, we can think of it perhaps in terms of these three uh, categories of individual, community, and institutional issues. So looking at the individual level to begin with, we see that, as I said before, tax mechanisms are totally ineffective unless there is an underpinning ethic of honesty, trustworthiness, and actually being willing to sacrifice, to say, yes, we need a health service, we need education, we need roads, we need everything else, I'm willing to sacrifice. And in the context of the equalization of wealth, I willingly give you know, a part of my wealth so that my achievements and my, uh, my wealth can be used uh, to benefit the rest of society. So there has to be this ethical willingness and understanding. And of course, the Baha'i teachings go a long way towards inculcating these values, these essential values. Uh, we can think about the factors that cause people to resent paying tax. They, they don't want to spend money on war. They don't want to give loads of benefits to the idle. And they talk about our tax money, which is a thing that's come up a lot in recent years. Personally, I think it's just completely false. You know, when you pay your tax, you've given it to the government to expand according to their policy and their programme. And uh, it's not your tax money anymore. Uh, so this, I, this is a very kind of pernicious uh, attitude uh, uh, about who owns the money. And then that can be expanded into a consideration of who owns personal wealth at all. You know, the recent, the 20th century is dominated by these opposing views of capitalist and Marxist economic theory that says, you know, that, that personal wealth resides in the individual or it resides in the community. And there's kind of uh, neither of these systems of belief about the ownership of wealth have really been very successful. But there is an important factor in the Baha'i teachings that impinges on this, which is the idea of hukuk Allah, which is saying that there is part of our wealth, 19% of the excess of anybody's wealth, belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us as human beings. And this is not a, a bad thing. It speaks to the dignity of the human being, which is, which is a wonderful thing about the Baha'i teachings, I believe. Um, you know, we've grown to the point where we don't have to be forced to do everything. We can actually have the privilege of owning this money that belongs to God. And so the giving of it uh, is, is, has a different dimension uh, to what has, you know, uh, to these other kind of uh, theories about the ownership of wealth. I just thought the ownership of wealth was a, an issue worth talking about. Then at the community level, um, the Baha'i teachings look for a society that is based on communal devotion. Uh, so the center of every community is a mashrik al -Azkar. It's a devotional space into which all people, be they rich, poor, or whatever their social background, will join together. And this is so important in creating a sense of common understanding about the needs of that community and the needs for which tax raising uh, uh, is done. And the, the mere fact of the rich meeting the poor, not isolating themselves in their gated uh, communities, uh, or the poor being, you know, in ghettos that nobody ever goes to, wants to go and see. This can stop and this can enable people to have this essential human uh, bonding and community purpose. And then they could understand how the funding requirements are different in different areas, be they rural, urban, or, you know, depending on the population density. Uh, and this can refine the collecting and expenditure of tax to suit local communities. So that's considerations at the community level. At the institutional level, what we see today is we see countries competing, uh, both in terms of offering tax subsidies to companies to come and sit with them in competition with other countries, acting as tax havens for individuals, uh, both of which are contrary to the solidarity of humanity as one body and, uh, and to the collection and distribution of tax. 
and they promote tax avoidance. So it's incredibly corrupt ethically. The whole international system is very, very corrupt. Uh, we see on company tax avoidance, this uh, profit shifting, which is, which is being addressed at international level. Uh, and the other kind of uh, devious methods that companies get up to to try and uh, avoid tax. But the institutions that exist at international level at the moment, for example, the OECD BEPS uh, framework, they're very loose, they're very uh, kind of uh, poorly focused and not very dynamic and active. I mean, they have a lot of meetings, produce a lot of papers and not really a lot of action seems to come out of it. Although I'm not that au fait with them. I don't want to portray a bad uh, picture for them. I'm sure they're doing wonderful work. You can actually join in those meetings if you're interested. But I think it speaks back to what Shoghe Effendi said about we need to have an international system that is underpinned by compulsion and law and proper consultation and agreement and common action. Uh, which is much more solid than what we've got at the moment. Then you've got this individual tax avoidance that everybody knows about, uh, diabolically sort of uh, devious methods of uh, avoiding huge amounts of money that, that should really be able to be collected by governments. One other little point which is specific in the writings, Baha'u'llah does say that interest on borrowing is a legitimate thing. So sometimes people get upset about tax and we go, we're collecting all this tax just to pay the interest on the money that we've borrowed. Well, borrowing money is, isn't necessarily a bad thing. And I think that's an ethical growth point for people in the modern world to understand. And the Baha'i teachings do underpin this. Baha'u'llah has specifically stated that interest on money is fine. Lending money is like any other commercial transaction. So that's another point. So in summary then, so that we need a spiritual solution to these economic problems. Our goals mustn't just be material. We must underpin our attitude to tax with personal ethics that are, that are very strongly founded in our individual beliefs. And I think this is the thing that we can do as individuals, whether we're individuals just paying tax as employees or as the owners of businesses uh, who, are, who are controlling corporation tax payments, we can commit, we can make a stronger commitment to following these ethical principles. They're very hard to follow, but it can be done. And Baha'is have demonstrated the willingness to sacrifice and make these kind of uh, morally correct decisions. So that's something we can all do. Uh, we can look at our own personal and our corporate affairs and make sure that they comply with these standards of honesty. We can look again at what Abdul Baha said about progressive taxation, think about community devotion and how that works through into an understanding of, uh, of how the way money flows through a community and uh, understand that we need these powerful international institutions and that things aren't going to get better until they happen. Thank you very much for listening.